Phlebotomy is the process of drawing blood by puncturing the vein and phlebotomists are people trained to draw blood from a person or animal for tests, transfusions, donations or research. The objectives of good phlebotomy practices are improve knowledge and awareness of risk associated with phlebotomy to the healthcare workers, to reduce blood bone exposure and develop safe practices, improve quality of lab tests by reducing pre-analytical errors and to improve patient confidence. Blood sampling systems are of two types, closed or evacuated blood collection systems and the open blood collection system. The closed or evacuated systems for blood sampling are preferable because they have been proven to be safer than open systems and provide better specimen quality. The added advantage of using closed system is that blood comes directly in contact with the anticoagulant avoiding pre-analytical issues like microclot formation. The use of evacuated blood collection system reduces the risk of direct exposure to blood and makes it easier to take multiple samples from a single venipuncture. Although vacuum extraction systems are safe, training and skill is required for their correct use. The system comes complete with needle, holder, and the laboratory sample tubes with appropriate additives and color-coded caps. Needles are double-ended and available in several recommended gauge sizes indicated by color codes. The non-patient end of the needle is covered by rubber sleeves and is screwed into the barrel, also known as the tube holder. A thread separates the two ends of the needle. It is where the holder is screwed into place. The holder holds the sample collection tube in place and protects the phlebotomist from direct contact with blood. As the sample tube is under vacuum, once the needle is in the vein, the tube is pressed onto the non-patient end of the needle in the holder and blood is drawn automatically into the sample tube by vacuum until the required amount is collected. The next tube is then placed in the correct sequence without removing the needle from the patient. The needle and holder are to be discarded as a single entity. However, there is also an option of using reusable needle holder or a multi-sample needle holder which has a system to eject the needle after use. The evacuated systems may also be used with a winged butterfly needle and a lure lock connectors. Open systems include hypodermic needle and syringes and sample container, which could be vacuum tubes or non-vacuum tubes. The use of a hypodermic needle and syringe is the most common means of blood sampling. Assembling of needle and syringe involves opening the packaging of the hypodermic needle, that is, the back of the needle, keeping it capped. Open the sterile packaging of the syringe from the plunger end, that is, back of the syringe, keeping the nozzle protected in the packaging. Carefully remove the syringe from the package and insert the nozzle of the syringe firmly into the exposed hub of the capped hypodermic needle. Leave the needle and syringe in place until ready for use. Selecting the gauge of needle. It is important to select the right gauge of the needle based on the age of the patient, amount of blood and type of samples. For example, thicker gauge needles are used for coagulation studies. Use this chart to decide the gauge of the needle. There is a universal color code to identify the gauge of the needle. Selecting the gauge of the needle. For adults, all sizes of needles can be used. 
whereas in pediatric and elderly patients with thin veins, only the 22 gauge or 23 gauge needles are to be used. For neonatal, only the winged butterfly sets with 23 gauge needles are used. Procedure for phlebotomy Assemble the required material. They are Closed collection systems or open system with disposable sterile plastic syringes of various volumes. Tourniquet, disposable well-fitting gloves, mask, 70% isopropyl alcohol swabs, betadine, dry cotton, band-aid, hand sanitizer, blood culture bottles, Citrate tubes for coagulation test with light blue cap, plain tube with clot activator with red cap, gel tube with yellow cap with clot activators and gel separator, green tubes containing sodium heparin for cytogenetics and plasma based assays, EDTA tube containing potassium EDTA with lavender cap, Grey tubes containing fluoride for glucose, black tubes for ESR, specimen storage racks, needle destroyer, puncture proof containers for sharp, biomedical waste color coded bins, barcode generator or a permanent marker, computer with LIS system if available. Pre collection verification and use of personal protective equipment. Approach the patient in a calm, confident and professional manner. The phlebotomist must gain the patient's confidence. Assure the patient that, although the venipuncture will be slightly painful, it will be short in duration and necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of their health care problem. Answer any patient query related to laboratory procedure. Confirm the identity of the patient with the laboratory requisition form. Wearing gloves is mandatory before sample collection. Wear lab coat and mask. Cover all injured or exposed wounds or cuts with a bandage before proceeding for sample collection. Determine the best site for venipuncture. The common sites are anti-cubital area. Median cubital vein is the most preferred site as it is large, well anchored, least painful and least likely to bruise. Cephalic vein is the next preferred site. It is large but not well anchored and may be more painful than the median cubital vein. The basilic vein is the third choice. It is generally large, easy to palpate, but not well anchored. It involves the greatest risk as it lies near brachial artery and the median nerve. Either of each can be easily punctured. Dorsum of the hand The veins on the dorsum of the hand have a greater tendency to bleed. In fat persons, however, it may be difficult to access an antecubital vein. In them, the veins in the dorsum of the hand are easier to reach. Alternate sites Phlebotomists will not collect blood except under special circumstances from the arm or hand from the side of a mastectomy unless all other sites have been ruled out and only with written permission from the physician or nurse. Limbs with indwelling artificial access devices unless all other sites have been ruled out and written permission of the primary care physician. Unacceptable sites Phlebotomists will not collect from fistulas, shunts, arterial lines or locks, arteries, femoral vein, varicose veins and the palmar region of the wrist. Venipuncture Venipuncture procedure includes Labeling of tubes which may be done prior to or immediately after collection as per the policy of the institution. The label should be clearly written with at least three patient identities like 
age, name, unique ID number. After the patient is made comfortable and seated on a chair, ensure proper positioning of the patient's arm. Apply the tourniquet with 3 inch clearance above the planned puncture site. Ideally, the tourniquet should not be applied for longer than one minute at a time. Note, leaving the tourniquet applied for an excessive period of time, that is, more than one minute, may cause localized stasis, formation of a partial filtrate of blood, and hemoconcentration. These may result in erroneously high values for all protein-based analytes like pack cell volume and other cellular elements. For coagulation studies, avoid using tunique or apply it for less than one minute as platelet activation may lead to coagulation testing errors. Clean the venipuncture site with 70% isopropyl alcohol swabs or sterile swab using a circular motion from the center to the periphery. Never do the reverse. Allow the area to dry before venipuncture. The puncture will be painful if alcohol has not dried. Hemolysis is also a possibility if alcohol gets into the sample. Do not repalpate the venipuncture site once it has been cleansed with alcohol. Alert the patient before venipuncture. Ask the patient to close their fist, but do not allow the patient to pump or clench their fist. Tell them to relax. Make sure that the patient's arm is in downward position to prevent the backflow or reflux. Anchor the vein and smoothly insert the needle with bevel up at 15 to 30 degree angle. In case of difficulty in location of vein, phlebotomist must tell patient about the same. Lab should have a policy to record multiple punctures. Multiple punctures can decrease patient confidence and satisfaction. A clean, sterile needle must be used for each new collection attempt. Never re-prick a patient using the same needle. Release the tunique as soon as blood begins to flow. Avoid excessive negative pressure. No attempt should be made to withdraw blood faster than the vein is filling. This will lead to insufficient quantity of sample, hemolysis and contributes to vein and patient trauma. Needle Removal The tourniquet must be fully released and patient's hand opened and relaxed before the needle is removed. Hold dry cotton or gauze pack over the site. Gently and quickly remove the needle from the arm and as soon as the needle is removed, pressure must be applied to the site to avoid leakage of blood and hematoma formation. Ask the patient to keep slight pressure on the cotton. The arm is to be kept straight and not bent at the elbow. Instruct the patient to discard the blood-stained swab in yellow bag before leaving. Provide the relevant information in case the patient asks the phlebotomist. Delivering the blood Deliver carefully into respective tubes as per requirement for test ordered and in proper order which shall be discussed shortly. Vacuum Extraction System when using evacuated system where blood directly flows into the tubes, ensure that the tubes are kept in place till the blood flow completely stops by exhaustion or vacuum. Place the next tube as per the order of draw till all the required sample tubes are completed. This would ensure collection of appropriate volume of blood without the need to open the cap. When using syringe and needle with evacuated tubes, opening the cap of an evacuated tube increases the risk of compromising the integrity of the primary sample. If a syringe is used, it is recommended to place the tube into a rack before filling the tube. To prevent needle stick injuries, 
Use one hand technique to puncture the tubes with the needle to fill the tube under vacuum. Pierce the stopper on the tube with the needle directly above the tube using slow steady pressure. Do not press the syringe plunger because additional pressure increases the risk of hemolysis. When using syringe and needle with non-evacuated tubes, first remove and discard the needle in Sharps container. Now transfer the blood into the non-vacuum tubes. Remove the cap of the container and gently transfer specimen into it by pushing the plunger. Blood should be allowed to smoothly flow from the side of the walls of the tube while ensuring that there is no froth formation during the transfer process. Phlebotomists should never push the plunger too hard in order to avoid froth formation or hemolysis and the risk of aerosol formation. Immediately after collection, invert gently the tubes containing additives for the required number of times as specified by the manufacturer. Do not shake the tube. Do not overfill the tubes. Blood culture sample is to be collected first and the sample is transferred into the blood culture bottle using a syringe or a direct transfer mechanism as shown in the picture. Order of draw. Refer to this chart for proper order of draw when using a closed blood collection system. The first to be collected is the blood culture bottle and should be inverted 8 to 10 times. Second is the coagulation tube with sodium citrate to be inverted 3 to 5 times. Third is the clot activator to be inverted 4 to 5 times. Fourth is the serum separator tube with no additive. Fifth is the sodium heparin tube which should be inverted 8 to 10 times. Sixth is the EDTA purple top tube. Seventh is the oxalate or fluoride tube requiring 8 to 10 inversions. Last is the ESR tube requiring 8 to 10 inversions. Standard precautions at sample collection. Assume all patients are potentially infectious. Practice effective hand hygiene procedures. Wear gloves during the procedure and the use of lab coats, masks and other personal protective equipment wherever indicated. Wear closed toed shoes or boots. Follow safe collection practices. Have knowledge of spill management. Get immunization, for example, the hepatitis B vaccination. Avoid contaminated equipment by doing routine and proper decontamination of surfaces and instruments. Practice proper disposal of sharps and infectious waste. Keep safety boxes at arm's length. The biomedical waste management. The sharps container must be within arm's reach and clearly visible to ensure safe disposal of sharps. The instructions for appropriate use and disposal can be displayed in the form of flow charts on the working station. Burn the needle and cut the hub of the syringe using the needle destroyer. Perform the following steps. Insert the needle in the needle slot. Push it gently downwards till arcing stops. Put the syringe in the syringe slot. Push the handle of the cutting blade to cut the syringe at the nozzle. The used syringes must be put in 1% sodium hypochlorite solution before disposal. All blood stained cotton, bandages, etc. goes into yellow bags. All infected recyclable plastics like tubes, gloves, IV infusion line, catheter, etc. go into red bags. The segregation at source of biomedical waste is to be done as per local guidelines. Never disassemble an exposed used needle with your bare hands.
Recapping of the needle is not recommended. If recapping of a needle is unavoidable, use the one hand scoop technique to cover the sharp end of the needle and thus to safely remove the needle from the holder. One hand scoop technique Leave the needle cap on the surface and guide the tip of the used needle tip into it using only one hand. Place the needle cap against a firm upright surface with its opening towards the phlebotomist and place the used needle tip into it. Lift the needle vertically and once the tip is covered, use the other hand to fix the cap into place. Clean the surface with disinfectant afterwards to avoid leaving any drop of blood. Prevention and Management of Needle Stick Injury The single most important measure to prevent needle stick injury is Do not recap the needles. Destroy needle in a needle destroyer and use a puncture-proof container for used needles. Keep the container close to hand to avoid injury. It is equally important to use proper protective clothing such as gloves. In case of needle stick injury, follow the protocol laid down by the laboratory, which is written and displayed in the collection area and usually includes Allow the wound to bleed freely for a moment and then wash thoroughly with water. Apply disinfectant and first aid dressing. Note down the details of the patient along with the patient ID. Report the incident to authority immediately whose contact number is displayed. If injury is caused by a sharp having come in contact with a potentially infectious material, consult a physician as directed by your head of department, as post-exposure prophylaxis or immunization may be required. Management of Spillage of Blood or Body Fluids a spill kit should be available in the collection area along with instructions for quick handling of spillage of potentially infectious material like blood and body fluids. The spill kit should contain disposable gown, gloves, face and eye protection, disposable absorbent material like disposable cloth or paper towels, disinfectant and forceps. Procedure First, protect yourself using gown, face mask and gloves. Second, contain the spill by placing absorbent paper towel or cotton on the spilled material. Third, disinfect by pouring freshly prepared 1% sodium hypochlorite solution on the spilled material and leave for 20 to 30 minutes. Clean the area, taking universal precautions, using paper towels which should be disposed of in the yellow bag. Management of vasovagal or syncope attack In case of fainting or vasovagal syncope, first stop the procedure, then lay the patient flat and lower his head and arms. Loosen tight clothing and call for personal trained in first aid. Once the patient has stabilized, assure the patient, remove him to a comfortable area and observe. Make a note on the requisition form. In case of convulsions or seizures, call for help and stop the procedure. Have someone hold pressure to sight and notify personal trained in first aid. Lower the patient to floor and clear space to prevent injury and do not restrain patient's extremities. Documentation at Sampling It is important to document adverse incidents to find areas of weakness and improve and reduce pre-analytical errors. Record all double pricks. A log book should be maintained by the technician indicating the number of needle pricks per patient to measure the pre-examination quality indicator. Daily filling of non-conformance form 
to record needle stick injury, spill and other adverse incidents. The procedure for management of adverse incidents must be displayed at the sample collection areas. Sample receive accessioning, processing and rejection criteria. The laboratory's procedure for sample reception should follow standard essential steps. All samples should be accompanied with test requisition forms with details like collection time, patient particular, fasting status and short clinical history. Samples should be unequivocally traceable by request and labelling to an identified client by a unique lab ID number. All samples received should be recorded in relevant registers. Authorized laboratory technicians evaluate the received sample to ensure that they meet the acceptance criteria relevant for the requested examination. All portions of the primary sample should be traceable to the original primary sample with the help of laboratory numbering system. Specimen Rejection Rejection criteria are designed to prevent inaccurate data and to provide result accuracy. The following are the criteria for rejection. Unlabeled samples Incorrect container or preservative Insufficient sample Suboptimal samples like hemolyzed samples EDTA blood with clots, overfilled or underfilled tubes Improperly transported samples like cold chain not maintained Leaking urine or stool containers Sample preparation Sample preparation is required to enable optimum reporting and to avoid pre-analytical errors. All samples collected in serum tubes should be allowed to clot for a minimum of 30 minutes before being centrifuged at 3500 rotation per minute for 10 minutes for biochemistry analysis. The centrifuging should be done within 2 hours of sample collection. All samples in fluoride tubes are to be centrifuged at 3000 rotation per minute for 5 minutes. The EDTA samples for complete blood count and ESR are processed directly. No centrifugation should be done. Urine samples are centrifuged at 1500 RPM for 10 minutes for microscopic examination after the physical and chemical examination are done. For therapeutic drug monitoring tests or toxicological analysis, collection is made in plain tubes. Do not invert the tube. Let the tube stand in the rack for 30 minutes till blood clots. Now centrifuge at 3500 RPM for 10 minutes. For coagulation studies, the samples to be collected in 3.2% sodium citrate tube. All other anticoagulants are unacceptable. The sample should be centrifuged at 4000 RPM for 15 minutes to obtain platelet-poor plasma.